Welcome to Mythic, a podcast where we explore meaningful living through the power of myth. I'm your host, Boston Blake. So this podcast came out of a question. At the beginning of 2020, I was prepping for a PhD program in mythological studies. I've been obsessed with mythology since I was a little kid, but in the wake of the COVID outbreak, I had to close my bodywork practice and my income dried up to nothing and grad school was off the table. The question became, what's another way to engage with other nerds who love mythology enough to go into a lifetime of debt just to discuss and learn about them? So here we are. Welcome to the podcast. It's my attempt to teach some of what I know and learn what others think about this stuff. Now, where to start? The beginning of time is just too far back. Let's start with the beginning of my obsession, Wonder Woman. That's way more fun anyway. If you've seen the movie, you know that Wonder Woman, also known as Princess Diana of Themyscira, is an Amazon. Amazons were an all-female tribe from Greek mythology, and whether they were historically real is a matter of some debate, but based on the evidence I've read, I believe they were. The movie says that Diana was the daughter of Zeus, but that is a damn lie. Wonder Woman was sculpted from clay by her mother and given life by Aphrodite. She didn't have a dad. That was kind of her thing. She grew up to possess, and I quote, the wisdom of Athena, the strength of Hercules, the speed of Mercury, and the beauty of Aphrodite. Now, I was five years old when I learned this. Now, today I know that there's still a pretty big departure from classical mythology, according to which the queen of the Amazons is the daughter of Ares, the god of war. Ares was the guy in the movie with the bad mustache that Diana blew a hole in his chest with her unexplained magic lightning powers. But that's not the point. The point is that as a kid, I had to know who these characters were. I was five and reading at the sea spot run level, not so much the level of the daughter of Hippolyta who relinquished her immortality. But the fates smiled upon me. The very next year, Clash of the Titans was released in theaters. Not only did it instill in me a lifelong irrational fear of scorpions, It also introduced me to the larger world of Greek mythology. Zeus and the Olympians, the hero Perseus, Pegasus, the winged horse, and Medusa, who was really just minding her own business when Perseus came and chopped her head off. But that's another story for another episode. Even though the movie wasn't totally true to the myths, it captured their essence and their astounding sexism. And it remixed them into a fantastic movie that I love to this day. They tried to remake it in 2010, and, well, hey, Sam Worthington is hot. So there's that. Anyway, as my reading improved, I sought out Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths, Edith Hamilton's Mythology, and anything else that mentioned gods and heroes. I loved these stories. But there was something else. They seemed familiar somehow. It would take decades to name it, but I eventually came to recognize the Greek stories as complex multi-level metaphors. They were at once a weather map of my own psyche, my own inner world, and a template for all the political and social dynamics that I saw going on around me. Myths are stories of archetypes in motion. They're universal repeating patterns. Joseph Campbell called myths public dreams and dreams private myths. Now, it's not the only collection of great stories. The Bible contains incredible teaching stories, but I could never get into it because it was taught to me as factual history, and that just didn't make sense. Even when I was five, mythology was allowed to stand on its own without any dogma. That let me observe these ancient patterns in the stories and in modern life and make those connections. The first deity I dove into was Aphrodite. She's the goddess of love. But what does that mean? Where did she come from? The short answer is that she was born from the sea foam. And that's accurate. 
In fact, her name derives from Ephros, which means foam. But that answer is woefully incomplete. It's like a kid asking, where do babies come from? And answering, mommy's belly. Sure, it's not a lie, but it leaves out some pretty important details. So where did Aphrodite come from? Well, to answer that, really answer that, now we're going back to the beginning of time. But before we do, two things I need to note. First, the Greek myths are from an oral tradition. They had been told and retold for centuries before anyone wrote them down. There is no true version. There are only different versions told by different people for different reasons. This is my telling, combining various versions I've heard and read into a story that I hope is both entertaining and illuminating, but also true to the facts as they were recorded in the oldest versions. In general, I lean on Hesiod, Homer, and Apollodorus to provide the most essential story bits. Secondly, I am an American. We're just getting used to the word Euro. I will undoubtedly butcher the pronunciation of a great many beautiful Greek names. My pronunciation choices are pale imitations of Stephen Fry from his Mythos book, because I love Stephen Fry and I want to be just like him when I grow up. Now, the beginning of time, or really just before. What was before time? Well, the primordial elements. And there were five of them. At least five that concern us right now, anyway. They were Chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, Eros, Erebus, and Nyx. What exactly does primordial mean, anyway? It comes from the Latin word primordius. It's a compounding of primus, meaning first, and ordiri, meaning to begin. So primordial refers to what has existed from the beginning. In biology, it indicates the earliest stages of cell development. In the beginning, there was only chaos, the void, the ultimate primordial deity, sentient nothingness. The Greek word we've translated as chaos meant chasm or abyss. But this myth has made its way all the way into scientific storytelling. The default state of the universe, quantum physics tells us, is entropy, that is to say chaos. From chaos the universe emerged, and to chaos it shall return. Everything that seems so solid now, from our bodies to our buildings to our civilizations, will one day decay, and where their shapes once were will be emptiness. And I think that in all of Greek myth, chaos is the only entity that is not gendered, which I find fascinating. You want to see a picture? Check out the Hades video game. It's so freaking rad. From chaos, Gaia emerged. Not chaos's child, but a divinity who formed within the emptiness, something solid, a place to stand, something orderly within the chaos. Gaia, not yet Mother Earth, was not just the mud and the clay and the dirt, but the entire material world. In fact, the words material and matter derive from the Latin word for mother, mater. Gaia's Roman name was terra, as in terraforma, terrain and terrestrial. And along with Gaia came a being called Tartarus. Now, was Tartarus a god or a place? Well, why not both? This is an important thing to understand about Greek myth. Everything had a spirit, a unique sentience. Earth, sky, rivers, caves, emotions, and even concepts as fundamental as beauty or abstract as commerce— Everything was animated, meaning it had an animus, or anima, a soul. Even emptiness itself. This is difficult, if not impossible, for us to really grasp in today's world. We are deeply conditioned to separate body, mind, and spirit. But in these tales, nearly everything possessed all three. Tartarus, then, was a personified place situated deep beneath Gaia 
It was a hellish realm in the furthest reaches of the underworld, and it would serve as a prison for the vilest monsters and human criminals. Psychologically, Tartarus is where we would exile parts of ourselves that terrify us, that we think are dangerous, and that we have to submerge in order to build and maintain human civilization. And regardless of the sound and spelling, Tartarus has absolutely nothing to do with the calcified gunk on your teeth. Also out of chaos came the god Erebus, the darkness, and the goddess Nyx, the night. And then there was Eros, the irresistible god of love who could make men and gods alike abandon reason in pursuit of passion. Eros, the force that pulls living things together to mate, and also may be the same magnetic force that binds the entire universe together. It was Eros who made it possible for Erebus and Nyx to conceive the goddess Hemera, the day, and the god Ether, the light, or perhaps the visible space. This story might be thought of as the story of the development of human consciousness at the individual and collective level. As infants, we begin in the undifferentiated experience in our mother's womb. When we're ejected from that, we become aware of something that is not us. We may differentiate darkness from light, eyes closed from eyes open. We find comfort in the solidity of our mother's body, which supports and nourishes us. And thanks to Eros, we have desire to pull us forward. Then eventually we begin to explore the world beyond. Now back to the story. All on her own, Gaia gave birth to two sons, Pontus the sea and Uranus the sky, who would become her mate. We usually pronounce his name Uranus, but since I have the sense of humor of a 14-year-old, I'm going to leave Uranus alone and stick with Uranus. Otherwise, we'll never get anywhere. Also on her own, Gaia birthed mountains, hills, valleys, and all the terrain where all the action would eventually happen. Because if you think about it, nothing had actually happened yet. Nothing could actually happen yet. In fact, everything I just described had to happen all at once, and it couldn't happen at all because time hadn't started yet. And without time, there are no happenings. Just be with that for a second. I'll wait. Now, Oranos and Gaia became inseparable. Literally. He covered every inch of her. The two of them locked in eternal coitus. Mother Earth and Father Sky were the world's first couple. And their incessant lovemaking spawned lots of kids. The first brood included 12 gigantic, powerful, beautiful beings. Six male and six female the Titans. One of these twelve Titans was Mnemosyne. She was memory. And with memory, we start to be able to link events. And before and after start to take on meaning. This is the beginning of time. Now with time started, the insatiable Oranos, who had nothing else to do, impregnated Gaia again. This time, she bore the Hecaton Kires. Their description is in their name. Hecaton means 100, and Kire, or Kyre, means hands. And to add to this biological impossibility, the Hecaton Kires, oh, I love saying that word, the Hecaton Kires also had 50 heads each. If there happens to be an artist listening I would love it if you would draw a picture of this and send it to me. Like, what does this look like? 50-headed, 100-armed monsters. It makes my brain stop. My best guess is that it was a metaphor referring to various tribes of about 50 people. Strong and dangerous, but unorganized and barbaric. But I am totally pulling that out of my ass. Gaia's third and final set of children were the triplets, the Cyclopes. You probably know these guys. 
giant one-eyed monsters. They were strong and energetic, and they were skilled builders and smiths. Their names were Brontes, the Thunder, Steropes, the Lightning, and Argies, Brightness. Together, they were the Thunderstorm. And volcanic activity, with its smoke and rumbling and sparks, indicated that they were deep underground, hard at work forging new lightning bolts and other such godly crafts. Despite the differences among his three litters, Oranos felt equal affection for all of them. Absolutely none. He despised them. He would not allow them to emerge into the world at all. Every time any of Aranus' offspring tried to come between him and his wife, he shoved them back inside her. There was no room for them, literally, between this inseparable pair of primordials. It broke Gaia's heart to see her children stifled this way, unable to occupy the beautiful world she had birthed. Also, it hurt. There was no room inside her either. Imagine an endless pregnancy that results in 12 full-grown children inside your uterus. Finally fed up, Gaia visited her titanic firstborn to enlist them in an uprising against the tyrannical sky god. She presented her kids with an adamantine sickle. A sickle, in case you're unfamiliar with ancient farming practices, is a semicircular blade used to reap grain. Turns out, it can be used to reap other things, too. As for adamantine, it's a mythical, unbreakable metal. It lives on today in the claws of the Marvel mutant Wolverine, adamantium. All the Titans were terrified at the very thought of opposing their father. All except one. Cronus, the youngest Titan, hated Oranos for what he had done to him and to his siblings. So Gaia gave Cronus the sickle, and he hid himself, waiting in ambush for the next time the horny sky god was ready to get it on. And soon, Aranos approached. Draped in stars, he stretched out and lay across the earth, expecting another epic lovemaking session with his wife when suddenly, slash! In a single motion, Cronus whipped out his sickle and sliced off his father's genitals. Catching the severed bits with his free hand, he then hurled them through the air, blood trailing behind and spattering to the ground and into the storm-tossed sea, where blood and semen swirled in the surf, frothing and foaming, and then something even more unlikely happened. A woman rose from the foam. And not just any woman. Aphrodite, the smiling, laughter-loving goddess of love and beauty. Aphrodite, whose name means she of the sea foam. Or just foam lady, if you don't want to be precious about it. It's ironic, isn't it, that something so beautiful could be born from such an ugly act, such violence and bloodshed. But that's the way of it. Now, do you see what I mean? She was born from the sea foam is just flat out insufficient and gives short shrift to this batshit crazy origin story. Now, with love in the world and the Titans able to live independent lives, the order of things was about to change. And the world was about to become a lot more interesting. And that's exactly the story I'll tell in the next episode of Mythic. That's it for this episode of Mythic. Thanks so much for listening. To discover additional episodes, information, and a host of other resources, visit mythicpodcast.com. That's also where you can find a link to join the online community, where we can discuss all things Mythic. And I'm on Twitter at MythPod, that's M-Y-T-H-P-O-D. Until next time, journey on.